Okay, it's told me that it started a live video, which is always good. Thanks, everyone. You're all amazing. It's um, fingers or okay. So it says waiting for Laura. That's great. If it doesn't split the screen, but everybody else can see, we'll just go and do it. Oh yes! Yay! Yay! <laughs> Oh, the wonders. Third time, Lucky. Thank you, everybody, for coming back because that's just awful. It's, there's nothing worse than having to stop and start again, is there? Oh, just when you think enjoying. it's all right to dip your toe in the water. Oh, I've got a swirly world. Oh, it's come back. Yeah, great. Yeah, Let's crack on then. I reckon there the, might just be a few slow bits. Perfect. Okay, so everybody, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Helen Williams. I'm park runner A6014, and I'm the event director of Harrogate Junior Park Run here in the UK. And alongside Bassos Alexander, I am a co-presenter of the Free Weekly Times podcast. Before we start, I'd just like to recommend that after this conversation, people check out the many park run social media channels in the UK and across the world as well as subscribing to the various Part One podcasts that are out there. You'll find me on the Free Weekly Time podcast, but there's also with me now Part One Adventurers and the 930 Club, to name a few of us. Uh, one final thing before we get going, everyone, it's really important. In the comments section below, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Laura during this, um, the lovely Kirsty from HQ will pull out all the great ones and we can ask Laura them at the end. So um, just to type away in the bottom and ask away. Um, so Laura, let's get going. For today's mm. question and answers, I'm joined by the absolutely incredible Laura Penhale. In April 2015, Laura and three other women left San Francisco, USA, to travel to Cairns, Australia, in a rowing boat. Dubbed the Coxless crew, they successfully navigated an 8,500-mile route across the Pacific Ocean, arriving in Australia after 257 days. Part of their inspiration was to show people that anything is possible, even when sometimes the challenge appears to be beyond their capabilities. They feel that everyone has their own Pacific and we feel that that probably applies to many of us around the world right now. So, Laura, just right now, how are you? <laughs> I'm very good, thanks. I'm on dry land, so I'm even better. <laughs> <laughs> so, I yeah. mean, how, how, is life, how is life in lockdown? Well, I mean, it's, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because I, I, I really appreciate that in lockdown there's so many there's such a variation there's people on the front line that are absolutely having to to work you know so hard and stuff at the minute and the the thing that I was I was talking about the other day actually and was trying to replicate that you know it's, it's not the fact that we're in the same boat is it it's the fact that we're all in the same ocean at this precise moment um and yeah and we might be fortunate to be in in different different types of boats at the minute so um so yeah so so for me to be perfectly honest it's the very one time that i've been in one place for longer than a week so um so actually it's been it's been quite nice in a isolation having been in isolation in a 29 foot rowing boat for 257 days suddenly isolation in a house where you've got a shower and you've got a nice big bed and you've got fresh food and you've got running water is um suddenly seems like it's a palace in comparison so yeah. it's it's yeah. always about perspective isn't it you haven't got somebody prodding you every two hours telling you to go and do your stint uh in no the seat. true true <laughs> and unlike yourself where i might have kids that are, are prodding me instead so uh yes <laughs> oh yeah we got woken up at half four. we had that power cut yesterday and we got woken up at half four this morning with oh. glee from aston who was running upstairs but i've got good news the electricity's back on <laughs> and it's half past four nobody cares yeah. um, so going yeah, right back him. to your pacific row um you know i was talking to my husband tom earlier about it and we were saying you know with all of these incredible stories comes an incredible backstory and i think nobody just you know what we see especially watching that incredible film which is amazing and what we don't see is all of the hard work that goes in beforehand. In fact, even going back further than that, what we don't see is um, 
what makes you decide to do something like that? So take me all the way back. Where did the idea come from? Yeah, well, um, the very original sort of start of it, I guess I was, I've been looking for something that was going to push my boundaries. Um, and I didn't know quite what that was going to be. And at the time I was physio with um, working in Paralympic sport. So I've, I've been surrounded and having worked in trauma and stuff as well, I've been surrounded by people that have had to face significant adversity um, that they've not chosen, you know, and they've, and it's always fascinated me to see people that, you know, have, have unfortunately gone through significant adversity and yet they've woken up and gone, oh my God, thank God I'm alive. I'm going to make the most of this. And it's made me question sort of, why do we have to wait for adversity to throw that curveball at us? Why do we have to wait for something so significant that changes our life so, you know, on a massive curveball um, to then make us realise what we're, what we can achieve? So it's always, it's been around me and I've been by people that I suppose I've been fortunate in that sense to be inspired by. And I therefore have all, and I, I suppose I'm a physio as well, that I always want to connect the people that I work with. So if I've been working with marathon runners or triathletes, I've, I've wanted to dabble in, in doing one or two myself, but not to any good standard, but at least to get some familiarity or understanding of what it is that my athletes are going through or people that I work with go through. So when I was working with the Paralympic squad, you know, I, I, I can't fathom or ever understand what it is to be faced with such a significant change in in your life that's long term but i would want mm. to how close can I get to understanding that how close can i make it you know get get that rapport and that understanding of what it is that we we draw on when we're faced with wanting to give up and so that's kind of my that was the seed that was sown in my head of trying to find something that i knew was going to push my boundaries to that point and it happens like for me, the the whole ocean row actually came out of the blue. It was um, I got a I got a, a Facebook message back in, and this was what maybe eight years ago, I guess now, nine years ago, nine years ago, crikey, that I got a Facebook messenger message from a friend of mine. Most probably that was like the first part of social media back then, and um, and she was like, oh, by the way, uh, I'm just going off on holiday, but I've heard about this ocean row and they're looking for teammates would you be keen to join and I was like oh my god what what would you mean like hang on no, no don't, don't go <laughs> I need to know more about this and that I vividly remember the next morning being like that that's it I don't know anything about ocean rowing but this is perfect I've never rowed before in my life uh I've, I usually do individual sports personally but support team sports but I'd never actually competed in in such a close-knit team sport thing and I was like this is exactly what I want. It's going to take me completely out of my comfort zone. Uh, I also need to put weight on, not get lean. So it's the opposite to what I normally do. I need to get, I need to get fat. I need to get put muscle on. I need to work in a sort of a team. I need to learn to row. And I need to be out at sea for a long period of time. I don't even know if I get seasick. So I was like, brilliant. This is exactly what I need to do in my life. So it was properly like a light bulb moment for me. And, and that was it. And from that point, that unfortunately, that team didn't persist, but it did mean that that row that was going to be the Indian Ocean evolved into what became the Pacific. And and at the time, the Pacific, it was we were going to do a race. And then I was asking, so I was like, well, that's like the race was only going to Hawaii. And I was like, well, that's not the Pacific. If you I, I want to say that if I'm going to say that I've rode the Pacific, it needs to be the whole Pacific, not a third of it. So um, so then I looked into could we actually do all of it? And if so, how long would that take? And yeah, and then we realised that it was going to be, it could be achievable um, at a push. So that's kind of where the story started, really. So you'd never really, well, you'd never rowed. So you'd never been mm. on a concept to, you know, your indoor rower before. And you'd never no. been out on water at all. No. And, and the concept too, I used to hate it. it. Like in the gym, I'd always be running or cycling or swimming. Like that was my thing. Triathlon was much more... I was much more happy to do any of those three things without a doubt or be in the gym. Um, but then I thought, and that was the point I did look at say ride across America and stuff. And, but I kind of thought to myself, yeah, but if it's running, biking or swimming, it's sort of, I'm already doing a bit of that. So it'd be half expected. So I quite liked the fact that it wasn't. And then therefore, um, also then everybody was like, well, you can't do it, which just then fuels me even more to want to prove, <laughs> prove people wrong. <laughs> the sadistic it's, sense. It's totally sadistic. I mean, I don't think, I mean, I, everybody likes pushing themselves. I've never thought about rowing across the, the Pacific. <laughs> um, 
it, it's truly wonderful. And I mean, we watched the film when it came out along, you know, when it first came out, we watched it and it was, and it is amazing. So, I, you know, mm. I do, you know, tell everybody, and I'll give everybody links to it later. It's called um, Losing Sight of Shore. But I just reminded myself and I watched the trailer earlier. And honestly, the goosebumps from this second it starts. And I think it's the vastness oh, of how tiny your tiny tiny boat is compared to this you know the that huge ocean it's it's unbelievable but you know if we if we talk about that that those first thoughts and then how they happen we were chatting earlier that if we were going to look at the synergy between that and the part run world um quite often what we find is that um when once we get to part run actually if you dig a little deeper and you ask people their part one story you'll say you'll hear people say actually i thought about it or i signed up for it such a long time ago but i haven't mm. been able to do it until now and i guess you know there's there's you can never make the right time until you do it and then it's the right time so i mm. guess there's a lot in in that goes between the decision that you make so you know you've you've gone or you've knitted all of those together until ha you know then you've said well if i go to hawaii that's just not it and so then there you are there you are you've done it you've kind of taken yeah. the first step into here we go but and i think that that's it quiet. though yeah, but i think that's it though isn't it it's like sorry jumping in there but that first step is so crucial like i think first of all seeing that you want to do something and like sowing that seed mm. and then it depends on what your motivation like for me some of the things that drive me is actually is is can be a positive can be a negative in my personality that I, I care about what people think like that can be quite a big driver for me sometimes so therefore when I decided mm. to do the row actually by sharing that with people meant well I have to go through with it now because I don't want to let people down I don't you know I've involved people and and sort of I've told people about it so therefore I can't not do it because you know that's just not in my DNA and it's also not it's it's one of my my drivers so I think it depends on sometimes like what 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 can be your motivators and actually use that as much as that might seem like it's a weakness it can be worked to your strength because it gives you the motivation to make sure you keep putting that step forward but at the same time yeah. that initial step like it doesn't have to be massive it's not like I decided to row and then literally the next day I'm stepping into a boat it was you know, and it was the thought of rowing two hours, you know, even on a go for one two hour stint, let alone doing it two hours on, two hours off for 24 hours for the nine months that it ended up being. It wasn't like we did that the next day. I kind of the first step had to be just sitting on a row machine and first of all, getting some coaching, for instance, or doing some technique. And I just remember doing the first like 10 minutes, 10 minutes of rowing felt horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And I was like, I've got to do two hours of this. And then it's not just two hours. I've got to do 12 hours in a day of this and 10 minutes of this precise moment. I've got blisters. I'm feeling uncomfortable. And it, I, to me, it's not about the row, but it's about that, that same thought process goes through in everything that we do when it's something new. And I, you know, it's no different talking about from a park run point of view. I used to obviously run previously, used to do park run previously when I was in London and then, Having done the row, I hadn't run for such a long period of time prior to leading up to the row. Then doing the nine months and I was like, you know, a rower shape. I was bent over double and I could hardly stand up straight. So it took me about six months just to walk for about, you know, more than about 10 minutes, let alone start to run. So then when I tried to get back into running, I really struggled because mentally, suddenly it was nowhere near what I remembered and it felt like a huge hurdle that I just so then I stepped away from it and then I was like oh I really would like to go for a run and every time I tried it just felt like a hurdle but I kept on comparing to the past and until yeah. I just went you know what I'm going to just go for a walk run I'm not going to wear any Garmin any of that malarkey I just want to enjoy it and so you know what if I walk most of this and I do a bit of a run like then that's still better than having not done it at all. So I kind of have just chipped away at, at starting to do a bit of a walk run, get the enjoyment, go on routes that I just, if I felt like, you know what, I feel quite good today, I'm going to go for a run, then I've done that rather than having any expectations or setting any, setting any competition sort of status with it. And I think what's really nice for, you know, just normal people to hear is, for, for me, and I'm sure everybody who's watching, 
we would look at somebody who's done this, such amazing achievement and, and just broken mental and physical barriers beyond belief. You, I, I would see you as superhuman. And if somebody said, yeah. oh, you know, tell Laura Penhale to go and do um, part row. And I'd go, oh, yeah, she'd be able to do that. Easy. You know, so it's really nice to be able to hear that. Yeah. Actually, you've still got to go and break down everything into a, into a, mm. a kind of manageable chunk so that you can, you can enjoy it. Ultimately, you want to enjoy it, right? So it's, it's yeah. nice to be able to hear that you feel you know you can yeah you, you're going to leave the past behind in terms of where you were and now you're just going to look at where you are now and I think it is a really important thing in a, in everything you do to not compare yourself but also to be able to just take those first steps it, and like you say we all have to go through all of that stage and then when you're in yeah. it you, you're in it aren't you you kind of well, you that's know, it. You've, left, yeah. you've left the shore as you say um, yeah and then it's just putting one thing in front of the other so let's Let's talk about your training because, you know, as a, a non-rower and I mean, literally, did you did you get on and do 10 minutes as your kind of, first, OK, here we go. I'm now training for I'm going to I'm going to row the Pacific. Um, oh, what does that mean? Oh, it means probably sitting like this for quite a long time. And or did you not think about it? And did you just get on a rowing machine and see how it was? Well, I mean, I guess the the point there with my with my background as a physio, I, I am fortunate to work in elite sport. My first my first thing was like, right, I need to I need to learn how to row, and I I kind of want to learn from the best because I don't want to be picking up bad habits. I kind of well, I mean, you do anyway. But it, yeah, if I could get the best coaching that we could get, and therefore try and get the best technique, that will minimise the risk of injury. Is what I was thinking, especially as the re- repetition of what we've got to do it for. So I reached out to a good friend of mine, Alex Wolf, who was the S&C coach, strength and conditioning coach at the time for GB Rowing. And I, I sent him an email saying, hey, mate, you know, uh, thinking of maybe doing a bit of an ocean row, uh, figured I'd better learn how to row first. <laughs> have, you got any, have you got any tips? Um, and also, do you know who I could speak to in Putney? Like Putney is, a, is when I, where I was living at the time is was sort of a mecca of, of you know river rowing obviously you've got all of the all of the rowing clubs across along the along the Thames so uh it was a great great spot to be living anyway at the time and I said you know have you got any contacts do you think who would you think would be the best for me to approach can I just walk in like how's how's this how's this work in this sport and um and it the great thing was he was able to then speak to Imperial at the time bless him um and there was a coach there it was one of the GB coaches and and he was like, look, if you're mad enough to do it, I'm, I'm more than happy to give you a bit of my free time to coach you. So he was great. And uh, I think he's now head of, head of Irish uh, Ireland coaching um, squad. But yeah, so they gave us some tips on the, on the ergo, uh, which was really, really useful to really, you know, where you get your drive from, move, the move of the legs, the move of the hips. Um, and then they, yeah, I, I learned on the Thames. So, and the classic is, you know, you, it was properly bog standard of, I mean, I, I was wobbly. I was all over the shop and it was kind of like, you know, <laughs> had to do this stuff called like chopping onions or whatever you call it, just to get your balance in the boat and your feel and at what point do you put the oars in. And and so, yeah, did a good sort of six months worth of that and loved it. Absolutely loved it. Sort of picking up a new sport as a, a blank slate. And I think that's the other thing that I like about it is if, you know, when you if you can clean sort of your mind and be adaptable and just be sort of like have no ego with it, have no sort of false pretenses or pretending to sort of know that you should know stuff. Yeah. It's great because you just, you, you know, you just absorb it like a sponge and, you, you know, you do it horrendously, but you can laugh about it rather than think, oh, my God, I should be better than this. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. So, so when, um, you, got, yeah, when you got in the water, were you just were, were you just on your own to, to kind of get a feel for the water before you kind of got in with other people? Was that yeah, what you so did? yeah, did, did sort of the individual sort of rowing, but like uh, as a skull, so crossing your arms because that's how we were going to row, and then okay. we did it as pairs, um, and then I I would jump in with with a coach that obviously kept the boat quite stable, which was useful, um, <laughs> and then uh, and then yeah, and then we we would we do that basically until our boat was built and and then once our boat was built and obviously it's it's a big boat it's not like what you see on on the thames which is a really fine boat really finesse and balance and and all of that stuff as as it's like a big boat with the cabins each end anyway for us to stay in um so yeah so once our boat was built we then took it out <laughs> the first outing and i'm laughing because we weren't able to blog about it at the time because, you know, we had a few sponsors starting and I, 
I didn't think it would be the safest thing to blog about actually our first outing because it really didn't look very favourable about <laughs> how our ocean road and crossing was going to be because our first outing was actually yeah not very successful at all we were this uh i got really excited because the boat had been put in the water what i hadn't realized is it didn't have it's called a dagger board which is a board that goes down to give you a bit of stability in the water okay it didn't have a rudder and it didn't have any weight in the boat so basically it was like a lilo you know sitting on the top of the <laughs> top of the water this big sort of carbon fiber thing and so we all jump in and we're like yes can't wait to get out and uh, the wind was only, it, I thought it was only about 10 knots, which I didn't think was that strong. We go out in Christchurch Bay. We nearly hit like a super yacht on the way out, first of all, which was, was a bit of an insight. Then as we, we come out, the wind sort of blew a bit and it just pushed us straight into this hedge. <laughs> so then we got stuck into some bushes that were inside and we pushed ourselves off. And then we finally do get out into a bit of an opening. And then, of course, the wind's quite exposed out there. And suddenly we couldn't turn the boat round because we couldn't get the bow through the wind. So um, we were stuck and then we started to be blown out and we would have been going out to the Isle of Wight out to sea. We we're like, actually, this isn't very clever. So I had to phone, had to phone a local rowing club to see if they were still around. I was like, um, is there any chance you could uh, come and pick us up? We were in a little bit of bother. And bless him, the, the guy came out in his, in his boat and had to tow us back. Um, and then he, then he let go and the wind blew us again and it went straight onto a mud flat and I had to jump out and I was covered in mud. So like the whole first outing was a complete, yeah, complete disaster. But yeah, to think we went from that to then rowing an ocean. <laughs> you, you, you're <laughs> it Robert, it's unfathomable because, you know, being in the ocean, I mean, for me, I just thought you must have been, it must have been something that I'd been in you, you know, the sea was in you and you just knew about boats and you knew about how they worked and, how could you mm. possibly, you know, know what to do in the middle of the ocean and how to work the boat? And I mean, how did you, did you just become intimate with the boat because you just lived in it and you had to know how every bit of it worked because you, you just had to, like a bit like me pressing all the buttons on here. I have the, the joy yeah. of being able to just walk in the house if it doesn't work, but you, you haven't got that when you're in the middle of the ocean somewhere. No, no, you're right. And um, I mean, we practice a lot in our boat and I, you know, Mark Beaumont, who's, a, who's an athlete that I'd worked with a couple of years ago and still do some work with now. We actually, I met him in the first year of this and he'd rode the Atlantic and not had a very successful trip. And um, I say not successful, they, they unfortunately capsized and nearly, that's the closest he's ever sort of had to, to losing his life. And, and um, we, I remember in the first year of this, in the preparation, I thought it was only going to take a year to get to the start line. And we we're about four months out from when we thought we were going to start. And I met Mark and he asked me all these questions. And I was, of course, you know, such a naive and uh, uh, over-enthusiastic little bunny. And he was like, right, so you haven't been in your boat yet. You, your electronics still aren't fitted. You haven't got this. You haven't... He's like, you need to practice. You need to spend time. Like, this is not something to mess about with. And it really sort of knocked at home. And I was like, actually, crikey, he is so, so right. And I, you know, as gutting as it was, it was the right thing to do to take that advice and go right we need to postpone this for a year and and get this on track and um and every every waking minute I could I'd be bouncing down to Bournemouth so I was living in Putney as I mentioned at the time working full time and then on a Friday night I would drive down the A3 and, and go to Christchurch I'd, I'd sleep in the boat overnight and then I would do like sort of whether it was painting or it was something but I'd just be familiar so I was always there when the build was going on and nagging the engineers and the builders constantly so I think I'm I can be a bit yeah a bit tenacious when it comes to that stuff being a bit particular but um but anyway I knew at least I knew the boat inside and out and then when the team came together we it was all about practicing and whether it was just even if it was on dry land it was just staying in the dock and sleeping on it overnight so that you got the feel for the space and then you got a feel for where the food was going to be kept and how you could cook and and then we did a yeah, we did a 72 hour was it 72 or 48 I can't remember now but a 72 hour say stint out of Falmouth in Cornwall with with our boat and the aim was to go out across to the channel you know into the channel to sort of spend some time out and practice our routines doing two hours on two hours off uh, but it, at the very weekend we chose it was like a force nine gale <laughs> so all the tankers were coming in and um, 
we tried to push out because we just couldn't even get out off the shore. And um, so we had to make a decision to not go out to sea. But instead, we we're like, well, it's all about just practicing our routines. That's what we've set to do this weekend. So we ended up, if, I don't know if you know Cornwall very well, but we went up and down the, <laughs> the, the River Fowl, which is where the King Harry Ferry goes across. And we actually just went up and down millions of times. It must have been about 78 times or something stupid. And this, the King Harry Ferry in the daytime was just going <laughs> forwards and backwards. Uh, and we just kept going up, turning around, coming back down, going up, turning around. Uh, perfect because it gave us practice, practice on the boat. And then when it came to actually launching and setting out across the Pacific, you know, our routines were set. We had familiarity with the boat. We knew where everything was. And then it was a case of, right, well, we've, we have sort of know as much as we can know. We controlled as much as we can control. Now it's about just mm. being ready to control the uncontrollables or be aware for it. And, um, and therefore, the storms that we're going to face, we've got a bit more bandwidth to cope with, cope with whatever's going to be thrown at us, in a sense. Which is like now, isn't it? It's it's no different to the current situation in the sense of you, you grab hold of what you you know you can do right in front of you. You know what you can control. You, your family, your sort of you know your immediate sort of things that are right in front of you, and then you've just got to take it step by step with you know what's going to go on with the uncontrollables, really. And and I guess you know what you've gone and done all the way back then. You know nobody had any idea. Three months, really, six months before any of this would happen but the kind of you know being isolated in the middle of the ocean and being isolated now they've got so much similarities you know you, you you've set off and you've gone off to do something obviously and it, you are in control because it's a decision and but at, at, at a certain yeah. point you are literally in the middle of the ocean and it would be really difficult you could get yourself into really difficult position couldn't you and that being in the middle of that and actually either having to go it's a bit like where we are now isn't it we're, we're kind of in the middle of it we've we've, we've mm. left the shore we're in the middle we still don't quite know where land is and and at the same time yeah. there must have been a point at that where that was like and have you managed to make the comparisons between that and where we are now and have you used any of the kind of mental um i suppose tricks yeah. that you would have used at the time yeah yeah, no, it's a it's a really good it's a really good point, and I, the the sort of the things that we would we often talk about as a team that we did out there with when we we had strength of having a, a sports psychologist that we work with that had taught us a lot of strategies prior to, and we drew heavily on those in in the very very difficult times. Um, but there, there's a lot that can be said for having been tested and challenged in a way where you know there were days when the currents, the winds were pushing us backwards. So we were losing a good 25 miles at times, you know, and we were just rowing to try and minimise the loss, you know. So yeah. you're, working, yeah. you're working hard every two hours to just try and minimise drifting in the wrong direction too far. <laughs> and it's kind of like you, you can either, you, you've got a choice. You can either choose to be really frustrated and angry and just mm. blame everything that's coming at you during those times but it, it's wasted energy. Like that is a load of precious energy and an emotional sort of bandwidth that you've got that is, is going towards nothing because you can't influence it. You know, and we, that hugely out in the row that, that taught me that was, I can't influence the currents. I can't influence the wind. And so therefore I'm just going to row to sort of hold whatever I can do. And at mm. the end of the day, at some point this is going to pass. But at the, you know what, we've got no choice. So what's the point? You know, I can sit here and be really frustrated, angry and just get depleted. Or I can just choose to do what I can do and just look literally stroke by stroke, shift by shift, day by day. And that's all you can do. It's no point looking at that bigger picture that's so unknown. Yeah, and I think, yeah, you know, yeah. that's all I can relate to now. Very much so. Um, we have got lots of questions, which is great. But before that... Mm one day in the future as we know uh the world will you know return to some form of normal um have you got any more adventures planned for ahead next steps the the biggest thing for me now is and the reason i did the row it wasn't about my personal expeditions it was about me doing something like that so that i could you know understand what it felt like to be on the other side of the table and now what i'm passionate about is supporting other people overcoming and pushing the boundaries of of human endeavor so and it, it to me it isn't just about 
it's not about rowing the Pacific. This is the key thing that everybody's like, oh my God, you know, I can't speak to you because you've rowed the Pacific. I was like, that's absolute twaddle. <laughs> like, you know, I can't even do a 10K run at this precise moment. So just, I'm not, I'm not this, I'm just normal. I'm just the same as anybody else. Like, but if I can apply the principles that I took to the row and I can put that bubble, I can put that planning and that sort of thought process to help other people overcome and step forwards into, you know, whatever it is that they might want to do. It, like we have all got our own Pacifics to cross. And that's something that we share as a, as a team that we've always said that it is not about rowing a Pacific. It's about, you know, just losing, having that confidence to lose sight of shore and just stepping forward so that you can you can take on whatever you want to achieve. Um, mm. and it's little steps it, that's such great advice because I think that is the thing isn't it it's it's being able to just move forward a little bit at a time that helps you get mm. to the end you get to the end eventually and yeah. we're all in these uncertain times but actually you know if you're certain about where you are now and you just you know you, you, you're certain about that aren't you you know it's that's you can it. only control what you're in right now yeah um, Let's let's go to some questions because I'm aware that it is late. Um, Simon says, as a physio, what are your top tips for simple strength and conditioning while we're all in lockdown? Oh, yeah, good point. Um, I mean, it depends. The biggest thing I think during lockdown is that we're not necessarily moving as much. You know, the, it depends. Some people might be actually utilizing this hour a day of exercise and that might be more than what we've ever done which is brilliant um and i you know the biggest thing i'd say there is utilize that that hour um even if it's just a walk you know and it's not just a walk because of an hour's walk is a, is still a good sort of opener and a good stretch mm. um but during the sort of times at home it, it depends on people's different activity level but i would say the, the key thing is you know we're, we're ending up sort of sitting I mean, this is classically, I'm talking to you now and I'm sitting in my window seat. It's the worst posture. It's the worst position, but I love this seat. And I do end up sitting here and I'm on my laptop. Uh, it's just, you know, the, the worst physio, uh, you know, ergonomic sort of setup. But I like it. So then therefore it's like, how do you keep yourself moving? Like that I don't get a backache and a neck ache from being in a poor posture that, you know, normally when you're at work, you might have a better setup. So for me, the things are trying to get yourself out of a chair position in it's you know, whether you just do, there's some great sort of yoga bits and pieces you can do online. And there's also just whether you're doing quad stretching, opening up your hips, opening up your sort of your thoracic, just getting your arms sort of moving over your head, opening up your chest type, type stretches. And there's a, I've kind of, written down sort of a, some of those basics actually in a in a blog that i think park run are going to share following this um i think Brilliant. chris is pulling it together so just with some pictures and whatever of just basic things you can do at home just to keep yourself moving a little bit differently and also i've just thrown in there some stuff that if you're if you're a keen runner that and you're not able to actually do the volume of the running they're doing then actually you this is a op opportune time to get your body conditioned so do your calf raises do your do your sort of, you know, your single leg squat sort of control, do a bit of balance work, do, do all of those things. You don't need any equipment for that type of stuff, um, but you do, can give yourself a the, good old workout. Yeah, you can do all the things you know you should be doing, but you always say you haven't got time for, and now you have really. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Kirsty says, why was your book called Doris? That was my lovely grandma's name. Oh, lovely, was it? Um, the interesting thing with Doris is that, well, I mean, that, that sums it up to be, perfectly honest there's most people that have got any sort of familiarity with the name of doris it's always with somebody that's just got a lovely personality with it it's somebody that's sturdy somebody that's reliable and you, you just think oh doris like that's a nice it's always gives you a nice feeling and so the funny thing was i was looking for i was looking for boat names and i was thinking oh, i'll go for like some greek goddess or like you know some what's it called the yeah just like some fancy name persephone or something but persephone's like maiden of the sea or whatever but it's so long so if you've got to read that over the radio you know papa echo romeo it's it's long you'll be there forever and a day so i was looking at different latin names and stuff and i came across greek you know greek names so went through the searches and i i think i'd put in something like greek greek words for sea or associated sea and suddenly amongst all of the fancy ones, 
Doris came up and I was like, Doris, it's like Greek. It's like, really? And then, um, and then it said, you know, Doris was the, the, apparently like the sister of the sister of the sea. And I was like, oh, okay. So it kind of caught on my sense of humor that one, it was totally doesn't sound Greek yeah. at all. But two, actually, I was like, you know what? There's something about that, that Doris is quite a step. It started off as a joke and then it's, it just totally stuck. And the, um, the the funny thing with with sort of the name of that of the Doris also associated to um, friends of mine had done the Atlantic row and they'd named their boat Patience, but the problem was they everything went wrong with their boats. So they had to really draw on Patience. So I was like, I don't want any name like Tenacity or something that means that I'm going to have to really draw on whatever we name the boat. So I thought Doris was a safe, safe, sturdy. Uh, reliable steed so uh yeah and that's exactly what she was she certainly was um <laughs> han 0642 says how do you get into an adventure like you did i'm very envious oh bless i mean the, the biggest thing is if you you're just gonna have a look out there to be honest i mean it's it's about getting potentially you know doing doing a few little small things to start off with getting your own physical fitness up and then there's great there's some loads of sites whether it's sort of world extreme medicine or there's you know all this sort of stuff you know that you can see coming up on the internet of of distance runs or swims or it depends on what your activity or sport you might choose to do and then it is a case of just keeping your eye out for for certain stuff there's there's facebook um groups like the adventure queens for for girls and and whatnot for just sort of and there there's people that might post on there that are looking for partners or mm. ocean rowing you know there's an ocean rowing society so therefore you can you can have a look at that and people are asking for teammates and whatnot so it's there if you if you want it it's just um yeah it's taking a step and like you did you just stepped completely out into a whole new world didn't you just you yeah know. and <laughs> you know for me it, it landed on it literally landed via a facebook message i would have never even heard about ocean rowing or thought about it before that message so so yeah it, it just Who depends knows? it's opportunities yeah. yeah absolutely dan wyman he says love hearing you talk about perspective having running water and a comfy bed what's been the thing you're most grateful for in lockdown uh i think most grateful is to be perfectly honest is in now it's it's the zoom it's the videos to stay connected with your family like i really as cheesy as that sounds but i do i do miss the you know the contact the the sort of you know we were my dad's 70th when during this time period and we were all supposed to go away as a family just you know airbnb or somewhere as, as a group with my nieces and stuff as well and yeah we haven't been able to do that and that physical contact you know you miss you miss just giving them a hug and i i have to go around and see them cross a field for goodness sakes rather than actually being able to give my parents a hug it's yeah and That's it's completely it is that. completely different as well isn't it to to you know when you are on when you're on the boat you there's you can't see anybody and you can't really contact anybody so you you understand yeah. that the second you kind of get yeah. on it and you leave shore but it, it's much harder isn't it because people are so close to family and or, yeah. almost you know in some places next door or opposite in the same street and you still can't do it so it, it is a lot mm. harder isn't it it's it's yeah. kind of in your face a bit more but you know, we are very grateful for the opportunity to be able to, you know, have technology when it works. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sam Rons says, you've talked a lot about preparing physically. How did you mentally prepare for your amazing challenge? Yeah, no, good question. We did a lot of work with Keith Goddard, who's a, a sports psych, well, he's an occupational psychologist by trade, and then he went into performance psychology um, sport-wise. And, um yeah, I've met Keith about four years. It was in London 2012, Paralympic Games, actually. And we were both working with Paralympics GB. And yeah, he, for his sins, bless him, he offered, he offered a bit of support. He said, yeah, if you need anything, give, give me a holler. And I was like, oh, actually, <laughs> would actually be quite good to u utilise your support. It'll only be for about a year. <laughs> and then, of course, four years later to get to start line, another year pretty much on the water. And, and now five years, yeah, five years post row he's still supporting me so um yeah Keith has been an absolute rock and the it was more the mental preparation that as a team we have collectively always said that that's what got us through got us through the row and, and made a successful uh completion but at the same time it also is what 
it connected us it, it kept us together and it also um it, it meant that we we not only stepped on as teammates but we stepped off as true friends at the end of it which was what we set out to do and could have easily you know you could that could have easily fractured the friendship couldn't it but you know yeah, you, although you work with a psychologist what what kind of things are they asking you what are they what are they preparing you for you know like for, yeah. for somebody who's never worked with one you know what do they do well, how they, do they prepare you what do they say yeah well this is this is the fascinating thing that i kind of i mean we we now you know i've worked with sports psychologists in in sport all the time and it's always about how to better your performance with the use of a psychologist but in the day-to-day -day world people only ever think of a psychologist in a very clinical space like okay you know it has to be something that you know you've got, you're in a very difficult difficult space and then you go to see a psychologist whereas actually it's the complete opposite for us like we see a psychologist to get us better to perform better and keep us going forwards and then because you do all of that work when you do have your dips you therefore have got a lot of work to rely you know you've got your tools okay. in the toolbox you've already practiced yeah. whereas trying to draw on a psychologist when you're in a in a difficult place it's really hard then to have the bandwidth and the energy to try and learn new skills if that makes I sense see. yeah 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 but i kind of see psychology as as the same as physical if not more so uh it's it's giving it the time and the space and trying to address the psych psychological part of training as we do physical training like you know if you're if you're able to to spend the time to do the 5k run at the weekends you know that half an hour support then if you could also support that with a half an hour another time in the week building a relationship with the psychologist or learning new skills in the psychology department you, your performance would just grow and that's a personal performance that doesn't have to be suddenly you know <laughs> lifting weights or rowing an ocean it's it's just about day-to-day performance it's about how you cope as being a mum as a as a dad as a as a business owner or whatever it might be it's just being able to understand what your thoughts are and it teaches you to be your self-awareness like so the biggest thing for me with with the row was all of the stuff I've done with Keith and the psychology stuff and then being on the water with the girls it was a it was constant building of self-awareness and still is your whole life should be about sort of how do you do you know yourself better because the more you know yourself and what triggers you what sort of fires you what what gets you up what gets you down like you're you, if you know that then you can you start to understand that actually you can only control yourself so therefore yeah. those times when you get so cheesed off with outside people that you just think oh crikey i wish they could change this and you know I wish they didn't do this and they didn't do that. And it's, it's, you know, your outward projection, whereas yeah. actually how you behave, how you respond to somebody is, is totally in your own control. So you can't control that person, but you can control how you perceive things and how you control things. So yeah. that's, that's where I see the strength in psychological, psychological training. For yeah, sure. no, that's, and that's really helpful for now. You know, there's so much of that in and around us, you know, even if it's just negative you know media and stuff like that that you can't oh. control you know there's there's yeah. a lot you can control about that isn't there because it's it doesn't always relate to you and you can switch it off um we've got two more yeah. quest questions christians um just keep plodding so did you take anything with you to remind you of home i did yeah i had a few things actually there was um i had i yeah there, yeah there were a couple of things there was um from my mum, bless her, I love penguins. Penguins are like my, you know, I just love them. I think they're brilliant little animals. They make me laugh, but they've also got a lot of love and care about them. Anyway, that just shows my randomness. But uh, <laughs> mum had given me like a little, uh, a little mummy, uh, like a mum penguin with a little baby penguin. And so that was really cute. Um, and that was just to, yeah, just remind me of home. And then the, I also had like some photos and uh another friend of mine had given me some little cards to open on certain days and stuff with either quotes or comments or drawings or whatever which were which were brilliant um and then the other thing from the psychologist we had we had to each do our own what's called performance enhancing strategies and that that it's like a it's like a table that you design and it's all about how you step yourself up into a different arousal level or calm yourself down and it could be that you draw on a smell. It could be that you draw on a, a, a picture. It could be a, a touchstone or a feel or a music or a quote or whatever it might. There's loads of things that you draw out and kind of what's going to make you ramp up or, or calm down. Um, so along that, I had, you know, different pictures that uh, would remind me either to sort of 
you know, buck up my ideas and, and sort of crack on or, um, or also just to calm myself down, which might be a picture of the beach back home or something. Oh, I love that. Liz City, last question. She says, Oh, sorry. Oh, somebody called. <laughs> say say that again. That just paused then, actually. Sorry. It just froze. Um, Liz, Liz City says, love how you chipped away to achieve something great. Do you really think anybody can do it? Uh, yes, I think with the right mindset and the approach, for sure. Uh, I don't think anybody can necessarily do it tomorrow. I don't think I could have even, I could even do it now tomorrow, if that makes sense. Uh, and I couldn't have done it tomorrow by the time I sort of, I judged it. I, I think if you've got the right mindset and if you're, you've got, you know, you've prepped yourself and you put the right support team around you, then yes, I think there's a lot of things we can achieve beyond what we, what we believe we can. Brilliant. Um, thank you everybody for joining and thank you Laura that's absolutely amazing um, so before everyone disappears I can thoroughly recommend watching Losing Sight of Shore so losingsightofshore.com which you can rent and buy on Amazon or iTunes I think it's yeah. just come off Netflix sadly um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much Laura um, just to say to everybody else do check out the many part run social media channels in the UK and across the world, as well as subscribing to the various Parkrun podcasts out there. Uh, as I said earlier, you'll find me on Frequently Timed, but there's also with me now Parkrun Adventurers and the 930 Club, to name a few of us. Now, more than ever, it's important that we all come together and support each other. The Parkrun family is absolutely there for us all, and we will get through this together. Thanks so yes. much, Laura. Yeah, definitely. Take oh, care. it's lovely to. Thanks for the interview. It's great, and um, yeah, good luck everybody with your running. Yeah, thanks. See you on the Thank roads. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.